So absolutely delighted to have you with us on this uh, exclusive insight interview. And for those that don't know, obviously, I know your journey and you've, you've got an incredible one. We'll tap into that in terms of the experiences working in Africa, like myself. Obviously, now you're with, with Rangers, working with the under 18s, and you've been here, there and everywhere. Could you tell people a little bit about you? You know, so who is who is Cameron Cameron Campbell? Uh, that's a difficult question. Wow, well, <laughs> I thought it was going to be all right about that. Uh, <laughs> it's been about me, but no, I would I would say I'm still a normal guy. To be honest, it's got got quite fortunate, but in terms of that work rate and to see where it takes you, so big big believer in the butterfly effect, but also collecting dots. So for those that haven't seen it before or read about the, the philosophy of collecting dots, it speaks heavily about just focusing on loads of different experiences, doing things in the present. And then when you look back, you can then start to connect the dots. So the difference between connecting your dots and collecting your dots. So in terms of where I've been and where I've got to, everything's kind of merged together. But when you're doing things at the time, you never know what one's going to take you where, which is probably the beauty of life, isn't it? It's exciting and you don't know where the next turn is going to be, especially in football. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it was Steve Jobs, wasn't it? He said you can, it's easier to connect the dots looking back than it is looking forwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, completely agree. It's interesting as well because often, I think a lot of coaches, I, I don't know about you, but we'll start off with a potential ambition of where we want to get to for sure. But then you'll often find five years in, 10 years in, you'll end up gravitating into roles that you may not have even aspired to be in or wanted to be in or whatever. But as a result of some of the experiences you've gathered, you know, it's, it's prepared you for that next role or it's leveraged you in some way, you know, as a platform. I mean, that's the bit that I'm quite curious on because you started off doing some, was it coach development or, or coach software type stuff? You did some stuff with TACX. He worked in the community, so he worked at grassroots level, right, with Aberdeen and what have you. Talk us through that journey from, from that to, you know, with the community trust to then, you know, work as an intern, I believe, and, and going on within the academy structure and then even at the, the sort of high performance level where you are now. You know, how did you get there and how did those steps? Yeah, so, yeah, so I've, uh, I had no real background in playing, no profile in the game at all. I played locally for a, a semi-professional level for a couple of years, but had a pure love of the game in in terms of not just the playing of it, but the the tactical side of it and more thinking about the game and why things happen and how to improve. So when I was quite young, 16, 17, that was my passion. Even when I played, ended up playing centre midfield just because that's where most of this stuff happens and you can influence games more. So from there, I then tried to map out a pathway as we all do when we're kids and we're leaving high school and the teachers say, listen, what's your career going to be? So I actually thought of going into doing sports science, a sports science degree because naively back then I thought my best route into coaching into a professional club would be if I could get in with a sports science degree and then coach, I could then go through. But listen, a year or two years into the degree, you quickly learn that that's not what happens in football. You get pigeonholed very, very quickly if you go into any club in terms of what your role is. So that wasn't going to be the path for me. I also didn't enjoy any of the sports science aspects of it, apart from coaching science. So I was really lucky in the fact that the university I went to, Robert Gordon's, they had so many different modules and it was such a broad course that I was able to study coaching science in two of the years and then specialise in it, which gave me that fundamental belief that this is actually what I want to do. So that was at quite a young age and at 19, I started coaching on the side. So during the university, we had to do a placement in second year. So they were massive on not just doing an academic course, you had to have that practical experience. So I got really, really fortunate. I was trying to get into a few professional clubs to do a coaching internship, but it was really hard because what I found was when I contacted all the English clubs, they were already tied up with universities down there and they had these programs well established so they had no room. So I got in with uh, TaxDex, which was a computer software that was allowing you to create your coaching diagrams and to turn them into 3D models, which has got loads of different benefits. Uh, but that was purely just working with software. So I would come in, uh, coaches would send me in presentations that they would uh, pay to get turned into 3D. But the biggest thing for me in that job or that internship was TATEX had the license with the UEFA. So there was pro license courses held in Geneva every couple of months or so that was the best practice. So four nations at a time would come together 
So I would get to go there as an intern and I would be that guy sitting in the corner on his laptop working off everybody's presentation so they could then present it. But I got to sit in every single presentation where they were speaking about coaching and everything else. So in terms of a platform being 1920, I was sitting like my 1.1, 1.2 in Scotland, which is the early stage coaching badges. But yeah, I'm sitting for a nine to five in Geneva with some of the best coaches in the world going through a pro license at the same time. So in terms of experience, that was incredible. And um, from there, I went into the, the Aberdeen Community Programme, which is brilliant. I think it was 2018 or 19, they won the best European Community Programme um, award. And they're really good. So I think their motto is opportunity and it's something else, but it's opportunity and they're writing that. So the, as long as you're willing to work hard, they put with me through my coaching badges up to my C license. And then of course, Aberdeen's a one city club. So the youth academy and the community practice was quite closely tied together because at that time, the majority of youth academy coaches were all part-time. So it was really hard for the youth academy to attract any coaches from anywhere else apart from the local area to come up and move there for a part-time role. So that helped any coach that was going through the community program, if they showed enough willingness that they could go into the youth academy and then progress from there. But I remember the, the first interview I ever had in football was for the youth academy and I got turned down. So I got to the final two and um, for different reasons, they said no. And uh, the next month they then applied for an internship within the academy. So I went for that. So I went for the full-time, um, not full-time role, the part-time role that was permanent. Didn't get that. Went back a month later, got the internship. And after a year doing the internship, I then got offered a place after that. So again, different things work in different ways because the job that I went for originally was an under 11s, under 12s role. I then got the internship at the under 17s and my passion's always been the slightly older age groups. So that meant that after my internship, I actually went in and started coaching with under 15s. So again, things work for different reasons. Who knew where I would be right now if I was working with under 11s and 12s and I got that very first role. Um, and then from Aberdeen, worked there for five years, completed my degree, studied a PhD in coaching science as well, which again was brilliant for different external factors and learning. And then uh, out of the blue, really through contacts, I got a phone call and offered an in, uh, interview for a right to dream in FC Norseland, which for those that don't know, is uh, the biggest academy in Africa. And it's also tied to actually it owns Norseland. So it's probably the most unique organization in the world and the fact that the youth academy bought the football club to become a, the first team for their players. So they were very, uh, very good at creating players up to 17, 18, but because they had no first team and they were in Africa, all the players at that point were sought after by every European club. So we had loads of players that signed for Chelsea, Man City, uh, Marseille, Lyon, all over Europe. And it was quite disheartening to work with the players for six, seven years, get them to such a level, but never see them in a first team. And then on the flip side, from a player's point of view, it was really, really hard for the players to transition from being an academy player, living in the dorms, being almost like in a boarding school type environment, to then being transferred on their own into Europe for the very first time. So moving continent at 18, start earning large sums of money in places where often they don't speak the language if they were moving uh, to France, although the Ivorians did and things like that. And then when we did a study, our top, top talent was moving to top clubs that were never succeeding for loads of different reasons. So the organization decided to buy FC Norseland in Denmark and they basically collaborated with the Danish Academy. So it gave us a European Academy and an African Academy that worked parallel to each other. And then at 18 years old, the very best players from both academies went into the first team. And because the youth academy were the ones that were driving everything, the first team managers were all hired and the whole philosophy was based on, we play the next player that's ready. And that's why they ended up being the youngest team in Europe for I think it was three, four years in a row. I think they're still in the top three because what would happen is players would go in at 18, they would get one or two years experience playing top level football in Denmark. Naturally, big clubs would come in for them. So Ajax came in and bought Mohamed Kudus. Sampdoria came in and bought Damsgaard that everyone knows from the Euros after scoring against England. Uh, Kamal Dean Suleimani is the latest one. Ren from League One came in, paid big money for him. So the plan was always that they would come in, they would get one or two years depending on their own individual journey. And then when they're sold, 
instead of reinvesting that money to go and buy a 10 million pound 24 year old from somewhere else that money was reinvested into the academy and the next 16 17 year old was brought up and it was their chance so being a youth coach in that environment was probably the dream because you knew that as long as you were working with the players and you got the players to a certain level then they were always going to get the opportunities because some of the biggest frustrations we have as youth coaches around the world is we all work so hard with players and for different reasons sometimes they never get a chance to break into the first team depending yeah. on what their mo their motivation is and what their club's history and philosophy is so it doesn't matter how hard you work sometimes you then see your players leave to prosper whereas we at right to dream and fc northland we could do all that hard work and then finally see them make their debut because i'm sure you'll agree there's no better feeling from a coach standing or sitting standing in the stands sitting in the stands and you see that young player make his debut and then going on to become a first team regular and then finally getting their dream moved to wherever that is so and um, that was a great great experience for loads of different reasons both on the pitch and off the pitch uh, for me growing up as well and then obviously moving back to Scotland which is something that uh, I'm excited to be part of that change. No I think I mean there's so much there isn't there one how you've navigated to create that career pathway you've had a rejection it's not a rejection really but you got a to told a no for today but not a no forever you found another way in you've used that to propel your career I'm fascinated by the PhD stuff because I'd love to dig into that deeper as well. Talk me through what it's like in Africa, you know, some of the experiences for those that don't know, you know, myself and you, we've worked in Africa. It's a completely different beast. You know, when people often ask me, what's it like? I'd often say, you never know what's going to happen next. It's very difficult to plan because things can change like that. Um, and yeah. the culture is, of course, very different, isn't it? But the players over there are incredible. The, the raw talent that you've got to work with, and they're so different, aren't they, right across the countries? Um, I mean, you know, so I'm, I'm fascinated to know what were some of your experiences having worked with, you know, Right to Dream Academy and, and all that work you've done over there? And how has that helped you in your role now with Rangers, with the under-18s? And is there anything you feel as a result of working in those sort of environments? that gives you an unfair advantage, you know, as a coach compared to those who have probably stuck in Scottish football within the, you know, the academy structure over there and so on. Yeah, right. So let's break that one down. That's a massive question. So a lot there, yeah. of what the, the talent was like, we were probably the most fortunate coaches in uh, especially in West Africa at the time because we were able to scout the whole of Ghana we were able to scout the majority of Ivory Coast and towards the end, we also were beginning to have resources in Nigeria. So in terms of population, um, if you think back to Scotland, it's like five, six million. My geography is horrific, but we're yeah. talking about like hundreds of millions of people that we can scout. And because they were the biggest uh, academy and the most sought after, we had to pick up players. So I always try and compare it to speaking to people here, being like, imagine I'm working at Rangers. I could go and scout the whole of England, the whole of Scotland, the whole of Wales, the whole of Northern Ireland, and I can select the very, 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 very best players and they're all coming. You've not got 40 other clubs that are competing for them. You're not diluting anything. So we were basically working on a national team every single day in training, which was incredible because as a coach, especially if I could talk from my own personal experiences, what motivates me is working with the best players in terms of really, really challenging them, but also challenges you as a coach because you're constantly trying to find ways of bettering, whether it's your practices, your design, the way you... Uh, provide the information the way you challenge them that's what gets me excited to then go and create new sessions because when you're working with those top top players you want to constantly push them to see where their ceiling can go because we say all the time we had uh, parents evenings for our under 18s before christmas and the thing we're saying to them is one of the best things about working in youth football as opposed to adults football is we have no idea where each individual player is going to end up so yeah. when we sit down with that player and we look across that 16-year-old player, there's so many examples. You look at Andy Robertson, you look at John McGinn and everything, who have had really mixed careers. When we look at that player, we, we can guide and we can predict a little bit. But the reality is we have no idea where they're going to end up. True. So we get to work with them on their journey to push them as hard and as fast as they can to then see if they can go become a starter for Rangers and then go and play in the Champions League and then go and play in the World Cup and all these different things. And that's what's really, really exciting. So working over in Africa, when you've got, instead of having potentially five or six really good players in your squad, you're talking about having like 14 or 15 out of your 18 
that are top, top players because they're the best ones in Africa. They're the best ones, wherever you want. And I think that was proven when we used to go to international tournaments. So one of the things that you really struggle with over there in terms of a coaching point of view is like a games program. Because if we're collecting all the best players, when we play against other teams, naturally it's not it's not going to be the same challenge. So what we'd have to do is be quite uh, innovative. So we would constantly play older teams. So sometimes the 11s would play against other local under 13s. But again, through no fault of their own, because of the country, coach education is quite weak over there. It's not a big thing at all. So in terms of what education other players are getting up there, whilst there's still loads of talent, it's very hard. But the game itself is massively based on 1v1s which is where I really, really discovered that passion and my love and something I shared with Mick Beale when I spoke about his experience being in Brazil. In yeah. terms of, I think it's through a pure lack, and again, this is where pros and cons come in. Because they don't have that coach education background and coaches aren't going on to the, the training pitch with the kids and asking them to play in a 4-4-2 and focusing on about building and all that, all they want to do is 1v1s and beat players. So see, when we talk about outplaying individually or combinations and first touch and the ability to beat players from different angles and all these different things. That's what Ghana's about and that fight and drive. And I'll never forget it. The very first game I coached in, in uh, Africa and Ghana, we lined up and the game started in two minutes and the opposition basically locked on, a bit like what um, Bielsa does at uh, Leeds. They just went man for man all the pitch and I'd never seen that in my life before. Like you couldn't even tell where the back four was or even if they were playing a back four, there were just spaces all over, but they just went man for man. But what that does is it produces such a different type of player that's able to enjoy pressures, thrive in pressure, actually go and seek it and want it. And where they lack is that little bit of game understanding. So over there, it's a totally different coaching as well because you're not going over there and really focusing on their, their first touch or the way they protect the ball or the way they dribble or even their athleticism. You're coaching them right where to be to make that the most effective thing that they can do, where to be to receive the ball to be dangerous. We did loads on things like scanning and stuff like that to help their decision making. Uh, so even those comparisons was totally different on a football pitch. And then probably one of the biggest things I took from a coaching point of view was, I love the quote, um, no one cares what you say until they know what you care. And if I relate that back to coaching in Scotland, it's quite easy to build relationships with players because you've loads of things in common with them before you even start. You're both Scottish most of the time. You both have the same background. If you're working at a local club, you know similar things. Going over there and being a minority person, being white was a massive thing. Because again, yeah. if you've got to look culturally, yeah, you've got to look culturally at, um, at where they've come from and their education system. And listen, it's horrific. And when you do your research and like one of the things, a lot of the, the players over in Ghana are quite small. And then when you actually do a little bit of research, you find that obviously your height's based off genetics and your parents. So see if you go back to the years of slavery, when all the big six foot plus players were, or not players, sorry, people were taken away from Ghana and Africa to go become slaves across Europe and in America, then that's made the population a lot smaller because by doing that after generation after generation, so loads of different things eventually make up what the current civilization is. So what happens is players are taught not everyone, but a lot of people over there are taught not to trust white people because that's what their common experiences have been. And listen, that's right for them because their experiences are what their experiences are. But as a, as a white male going over, they don't know me. I can't relate to them. I don't know what they've come from. I don't know their backgrounds. I can never pretend to understand what it's like to grow up where they've grown up. So it's finding different ways to go and connect and build a relationship to then allow you to actually coach that player. So instead of going in their first couple of sessions and starting to correct their technique or trying to work on anything, whether it's their, foot, uh, their right foot passing or their ability to take players on, the very first thing you need to go and do is trying to build that little, little relationship with them, find out where they came from, find out about their family, what's important for them. It's the same thing as what you do over here. You find out what the driver is, why you want to be a football player. Do you need to be a football player? But their drivers and their motivations is totally, totally different. So I think from a, a bit of checking yourself and your own experiences and your own thought processes, going over there and learning to be that minority. So walking into a pub and being one of three white people in that pub and how that feels for everyone to turn around and look at you. Now, listen, they're not judging you, but even that feeling of walking in and going, oh, this is, this is not, it's a little bit uncomfortable because then when you come back over here, you can 
and start putting those experiences, which I'm sure you've encountered as well from being in Africa, you can relate much more to different people's viewpoints and, and understand why they might think differently to what we would consider normal or, or traditional being in Scotland. No, there's a lot you said there. I mean, the, and I can see, you know, we'll probably tap into some of my mixed experiences as well, because what a top influence he will have had. Um, you know, for me, I, there was something you talked about where, again, going into these environments, you're going to see different things. I remember the first time I saw Morocco play Ghana, actually one of the first games I had, I think it was under 17 play. And again, all the things that you described, but some of the abilities 1v1, duels, aggressiveness, athleticism of the number nine, some of the strategies that you would see in terms of how they would play the game, completely different to what you typically expect. I've seen a lot of teams play very similar. You know, a lot of African teams are certainly, you know, I've seen in Morocco, you know, one four three three and pretty much running straight lines, not a lot of real movement or clever, intricate movements. The Moroccan players, I always felt, were just so, because they're always playing on the street, they're so gifted, very technically, very technically strong. Probably not the best athletes or athletic capabilities in terms of some of the other African countries. But from ball handling skills, manipulation, cleverness, technique, really strong. Um, probably similar in terms of when you said about game intelligence or or game understanding. I know CAF are trying to improve coach education, but as you know over there, it's so different. And what you get in each of these countries will be so different. Um, I think it's interesting as well because culturally, you know, I mean, you talked about different cultures. I mean... In Morocco, it's slightly different, probably because we're closer to Europe. So we had more of a European feel. There's probably a lot more uh, Caucasian or whatever. And so obviously that would change the, the, the further south you go or yeah. Sahara or, or certain places you go in. I was fortunate. I lived in, worked in Rabat and the National Training Centre's in Rabat. So it had a very European feel to it. Um, but in terms of something you said as well, I'm really curious about, you know, find people that don't think like you, you know, so you talked about different experiences there or different strategies or people or how you might have looked differently. And then you'll be able to use that even in your experiences now working in Scotland. I think that's so important. I mean, I'd often sit on tables where you, you're only speaking French, you know, in Morocco, you can literally speak French, of course, some Spanish or Arabic. And I know obviously French is one language in Ghana, but there's many, I mean, some of the, the, the native tongue in Ghana, the different dialects is completely different. Um, yep. So you've got all that to do with, haven't you? There's one thing you mentioned as well, um, around 1v1s. And it's quite interesting. I'm curious, you know, obviously some of the things you've talked about there about the identity of the player, knowing the journey of the player, you know, what motivates them and why they're here. How has Beale influenced your game or some of the stuff certainly when he was there during his time at Rangers with you or even prior to that um, and even some of the other curiosities you've had around 1v1s, duels you know developing players as the individual seeing that player as an individual project um, you know how has that shaped and evolved whether it's through him or through others? Yeah so the way I see it youth football is an individual sport now Every single one of those individuals is on their own little journey as well, depending on the age and stage. And one of the reasons I love working with the 18s is because most of the players in that group are really on an individual one. So if you're working with under 12s, they're all their own little individual people, but their journeys are quite similar at that point. Once you get to under 18s, we've got players that are 15, 16, 17, and 18 in that group. Now, some of them are trying to go straight into the first team. Some of them are older, they're looking to go on loan. Some of them are looking to progress in different ways. Some of them are looking to international recognition. So I love treating it like that. And I think it was, I think it's Johan Cruyff's quote, and I'll mix big on this one as well. It's like, teams don't learn, individuals learn. So even yeah. if you're the most team thought after coach in the world, to, in my head and in my opinion, it makes no sense to disregard the individual because if you improve 11 individuals, your team's going to get better. So in terms of mix, mix, mix influence on me has been massive. I can't hide that. Um, and I would never because I'm really appreciative. So I first met Mick when he came to Aberdeen as the Liverpool under 23, uh, 21s coach. And he did an in-service. And listen, he spent so much time with all the coaches there. And um, off the back of it, uh, I got his contact details. And, you know, like a lot of people give up their details. And when you go to try and contact them, they don't actually get back to you because 
I'm the one at that point. I'm a little part-time coach. I'm 20. I'm from Aberdeen. I'm literally nobody in the game. Yeah. And uh, when I contacted Mick to see, I was in Liverpool for a conference from university. And I asked if he'd have half an hour to spare just to go through something. And we ended up sitting in the pub for three, four hours talking about everything and how much time he gave me. And from there, we just kept on speaking. And in terms of the viewpoint on football, so depending on how you look about it, and listen, this is why everyone loves football, you can have so many different viewpoints on it. But the way you break it down in terms of the game is just 1v1s all over the pitch. Now, whether you make that 1v1 a 5v5 or a 3v3, or even if you look at the way you can break down the game, so something that Mick was massive on was doing the maths and something that we do quite a lot in the Rangers Academy. So if we're talking about doing the maths, that can be all over the pitch. So your decision-making of whether to complete a switch or not might determine on if it's a 1v1, because not all 1v1s are equal. So if I look up and see it's a 1v1 and it's my best winger again, that's really fast against a slow defender, I might play. But it might be a 1v1 and it's unequal in their favour. So you're then waiting for a 2v1 before you switch it. Or even little things where if you look at traditional, again, or generic Scottish centre-backs won't step in and play football. So see if you discard them from the numbers, you're then talking about playing 10 outfielders that you've got against uh, their seven. Because you take away, um, yeah, eight, sorry. So you take away the goalie, you take away the two centre-backs. So then you're playing 10 v 8. So then if you're looking about guiding the game, even out of possession, it's all about doing the maths. So regardless of where you go with the game, in my opinion, it still comes down to either 1v1s or 2v2s in different areas of the pitch. So if you want top, top teams to go and break through that, and it's quite interesting, we were doing a, a study and we had a, a presentation this week at Rangers and it was actually looking at what does true compactness look like in modern football? Mm-hmm. So as coach education's enhanced within Europe and teams are much more organised and you see all the time, even minnows, as they would call them in international football, can now get much better results because the coaching and the, the tactical discipline that exists so much better. So we, we had a few examples of, I think it was Iceland, being uh, 17 metres depth. Now, we talk all the time, if you can be 25 metres, you're happy. 17 metres depth, which is barely outside a penalty box, and being narrower than six. So see if you're talking about that kind of compactness. The only way you can break that down is either by really great combinations and good intelligent runs, or yeah. by players being able to go 1v1, being Probably really comfortable fine, receiving yeah. the ball under pressure. Yeah. So again, regardless of what you want your team to look like, it's never bad to have players that are able to go 1v1. And I think something, again, that we always get caught up on and thinking that 1v1s is always running at somebody. So your classic 1v1s, like yeah. a Neymar against a fullback, I hate it. Because you'll speak to midfielders about improving their 1v1s, and that's their first thought. They're like, I, but I don't like driving and dribbling with the ball. It's like, that's not a 1v1. A 1v1 is you receiving the ball with a player coming from behind, and you're on the edge of your 18-yard box. We still want you to go forward. And again, goes back to coaching. If you're playing against a team, if you want to play up from the back and the team that you're playing against is really, really good at pressing, you need three or four top 1v1 players that are either fullbacks, centre mids or strikers or forward players that are really comfortable receiving the ball under pressure, receiving the ball, knowing where it's coming from. And that's why I ended up st- uh, spurring my scanning research because I was fascinated by the players that were able to do that. And then when I started doing the academic research as well, related to scanning, it became such a determining factor between uh, categorising players because if you look at it without going into it, players that are playing in the Premier League, it's very hard to find a player that you could say is technically poor. They're playing in the top division in a top five league. You're not going to say the player's technically poor. But what ends up happening is the speed that they play at or their decision-making or their first touch or the frequency or consistency that they do preferred actions is poor. And that all comes back to scanning and then decision-making. So again, the the 1v1 traits and the way we describe it in terms of outplaying, because again, outplaying is more generic and it's more player friendly because you're talking about just going forward and beating that opponent, however it's going to be, is massive, really big. No, I love it. To be honest with you, you're just fueling my biases because there's so much in that. And you're so right because obviously they're all little jewels, but equally, you know, even working underloaded, actually developing practices where players are working 1v2, 1v3. So they're getting those 1v1s, but dealing with pressure from around, behind, behind, around, behind, into the side. So they're getting loads of different, because the point you're making is how do you unlock those tight defences? How do you do something? How do you play with disguise and deception? You know, which should be a premium value. Um, I mean, 
again, you know, I think we've got to be care clever and careful with the vocab. So when we're coaching, dribble when you can, pass when you must. If you can step in and dribble, if there's space to do so, if you can, drive into that space. If you need to stay on the ball, stay on the ball. So, you know, the points, but if you need to break a line with a pass, do it. Um, but I like the point you're making there. You know, if the players aren't technically proficient and they're getting high pressed or counter pressed and after that initial transition and they haven't got an option on the ball, they've got to find a way to get out of that trouble, aren't they? And we've got to create this freedom where they can they can ex, they can experiment, they can play with that type of stuff and be creative. Um, obviously, you know, I'm fascinated with the scanning, visual search. I mean, it's been part of my research for years and as is yours. And I think that's an interesting piece because <clears throat> often co some coaches will design practices where they're eliminating choice. So they're reducing the player's ability to look for information from the environment in order to come up with their own adaptable movement solution. Because, you know, for me, every player has their own unique movement signature. So once we've got our head around that, it's then understanding how can we use feedback to guide their attentional search. And then I hear a lot of people talking about scanning and looking. But as you know, you know, looking doesn't mean seeing. So you've got frequency and you've got just where you, where you look doesn't mean where you're attending to either. So it's, yeah. it's trying to develop players to become really clever and purposeful in how are they looking for information and where are they attending to in order for them to understand what to do in the right moments to solve that problem. Because some players will be scanning, but the players on the ball is having touches. So if they're not seeing that, by the time they receive, they're going to be off balance, they're going to have a bad touch or whatever. So where are you doing your scanning? When are you choosing? I'm just curious now, delving deep into your coaching philosophy, because we've got a little bit there. Talk me through how you use feedback. How do you use feedback in your everyday coaching practice and even the designs of your practices to guide attentional search? You know, because yeah. you've got different types, haven't you? You've got those coaches that will pretty much tell and give direct instructions, say, do this, do that. They'll tell them how to move, where to look and what to do. I'm just curious on that continuum. Where are you? Are you over here? Are you a magic spot in the middle? Do you float? Are you way over here? And when and wherever you are, how do you how do you use feedback and, and practice design to develop those skills, to develop those decision making skills, those visual search, scanning, and basically intelligent decision making? Yeah, I think that's something that's changed massively as I've grown as a coach and developed differently because. I think when I first started coaching and you do your reading, you're always like, no, I'm, I'm totally questioning an answer and I would never be this and I'd never right. be that. And then as you go through football and everything we spoke about there is the biggest thing I always come back to because we have loads of tactical debates all the time is there's no definitives or um, definites in football. There's no one right way, no wrong way. And it comes back to that. Every single player is their own little in, in, uh, individual. They're on their own little journey. Yeah. I would use a different type with the same player on a different day, depending yeah. on what his mood is. Because, again, if I just relate this now to working in the 16s, uh, sorry, the um, 18s who go from 16 to 18, and they're all that different stage of their personality, and they're all that brilliant bit where they think they know football, which is brilliant because I love that because then you get real debates on the training pitch and analysis room and stuff like that. So... We could be doing the exact same practice with the exact same player on a different day. And depending on what their mood is like that day, that's part of that coach intelligence, that emotional intelligence as well, because there'll be a time where their mind is much much more open to the, the idea of being challenged and being questioned because they're in a good headspace. But there's times when they need to be told what you need to do as well. Yeah. Because if we're looking at developing players for the first team, sometimes it's good to have a debate and... I'm saying it there, there's no right or wrong way, but there might be a right or wrong way to play in our first team. So sometimes the player needs to be told this is what's happening. Sometimes the player needs to be guided. So again, that's something that's massive for me. And you see the debate all the time on Twitter, especially about somebody will put up a practice, whether it's opposed or unopposed, and you'll get heaps of people battering and being like, oh, you can't do unopposed drills, or you, you can never do unopposed drills, or unopposed drills are the best thing in the world. And it's like, everything's great, as long as it's at the right time. Because you, every drill has been created and the outcome for a specific outcome. So it's working out what outcome you want to get that from. So it'll be days uh, at Rangers, we work quite differently. We have like a player in a team day, 
and on a player day, everything, small spaces, tight spaces, the maximum we play is 3v3. So we normally go from 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 on a player day, really small. And we're looking on intensity in terms of the physical outputs, but the technical outputs is that speed of play, looking after that first touch, that outplaying scenario mm. in terms of dribbling and passing and challenging the players. If you're in a tight space, is it better to dribble or pass? And then on a team day, it's a complete flip. So we go much bigger spaces. We're looking instead of like heart rate and intensity of pressing, we're looking at the duration. Can you have high intensity distance? But if you, you flip that back to football skills, it's about, right, what's your range of passing? Like, what's your positional awareness like? So instead of constantly being in a 1v1, because you can never really stand anywhere that it's not a 1v1, because it's a small pitch, you've now got a massive pitch. So can you go and evade space and things like that? So even by, you can do the same practice, but the size of the practice can change your decision making. So if I do this exact same 4v4 with the same rules, same conditions, wherever that's going to be, if I just make that pitch much, much bigger, all of a sudden the players got a totally different thought process and decision making to do. So that's really interesting for me. And that's where I think the feedback comes from. I spoke it there, knowing the player. So getting that wee relationship with the player. So see, sometimes when you need to have a wee pop at them or a wee blast at them, they'll take it. And players are much more effective at taking it when they respect you. And respect's totally different. If we look 30 years ago or 20 years ago, oh, respect God, yeah. would have been if you're, if they've got a little bit of fear of you. Yeah, they, yeah. And even if you look back to where, again, this is where everything comes as a culture and society, the way kids are taught in school now is totally different. So 20, 30 years ago when I was in school and when you were in school, a teacher would have no problem at all screaming and shouting at you and blasting you. doesn't yeah. happen anymore. So again, you've got to work that one out. So in that, that's probably more of the on-the-pitch feedback. But I love and I'm obsessed with the analysis with players because I think you get so much more from them when you can sit down with a bit of video when there's no emotions involved and you can go through it. So the reasons I love analysis is because, one, it's no uh, opinion. It's pure fact. So it takes away that conflict straight away. So if me and you are sitting down and I'm trying to work on making you better, because that's my only job as a youth coach, is to make you as an individual better. So see if I can say, listen, we're working on your scanning and you've only scanned 14 times out of 47. That's not me coming to you saying, I think you're a bad scanner. And already your guards are up and you're defensive and you're saying, no, hold on, that's wrong because how can you prove that? You hear it all the time with coaches being like, I want you to do this more. But you don't know if they do it more or not. Yeah. So even from a basic point of view, of getting the player buy-in and getting that coach athlete relationship to be like, right, how are we going to add scanning to your game? Even the words that you use. So instead of saying but or negatives and oh, you did that really, really good 1v1 skill, but then you shanked the cross up the pitch. It's, no, you did that really, really good 1v1 skill. Imagine what we could do if we could add crossing, that extra cross or that type of cross to your game. So all these things start working together. Mm -hmm. So in terms of when you do the analysis, again, I'm just going on a massive tangent here. Yes, you can tell, I hate speaking about me, but I love speaking about football. So <laughs> if, you're then, if you're then looking about the best ways to do the analysis, whatever you provide to that player, it needs to be important to them. It needs to either determine what practice you do or the data needs to directly influence their development. And I see way too much bits of data collected by analysts. And listen, most of the time it's not the analyst's fault because they're working in separation to the coaches and they're actually wasting their time. They might be top, top analysts, but they're wasting their time collecting data that when I get it, I can't use it from a coaching point of view to make my session design better for the player. So things like that we try and collect, we do individual player development reports and uh, that we've introduced at Rangers. And if I'm looking at a centre mid, it might tell me how many times he scanned. So I can then go and work on that with the player. It'll tell me where he takes his touches and where he places passes. So is it sideways, is it forward? Does he take his touch, or touch sideways or forward? If we're looking at an attacking player, it will show me where he makes his runs from. It will show me where he uh, takes his shots from. So whether that's an IPT or a team session that we're then going to create, I can create that session purely for that player. And then you can start working with it. So we always do facts and stats that are really, really important to the player that we can build and we can set targets off of. And we can also track their development because I'm quite um, driven to make sure that I can be the best coach I can be. So if I'm working with a player for 10 weeks and I'm tracking his stats and he's not getting better, I'm, that's me. I've got to look at myself first of all. I can't blame that on the player because if he's not uh, developed over 10 weeks, I need to go back, right? Is yeah. the practice we're doing realistic? 
am I helping the player? Does the player understand the way I'm trying to teach him? I might have to change the conjunction, but again, with the video, because context is really, really important. So, um, so yeah, that was a wee tangent. I, this, no, it, great. A big topic. We do so much with it. It's such a big topic. But, um, but yeah, that's probably a, a really quick two-minute summary of it. <laughs> Listen, absolutely 10 out of 10, because you're sharing your beliefs and what you're passionate about, but it's real experience, isn't it? And there's a word, well, there's a few words that you use quite regularly, which I like. For me, we've got to be careful of dualisms and going from here to here. And you said context, which is key, and yeah. it depends. And you're absolutely right, it depends. Um, and that can be taken on with many different things, whether it's the design of the practice, whether it's the use of feedback, whether it's... And if you can create a way where the player's driving it, and they're taking ownership for the learning. They're the ones coming to you with feedback. They're asking for feedback, not you always dictating how and when they receive it, but if they're coming to you as a coach, it's even better, isn't it, if they're using their clips and they're going, hey, Cameron, I've watched this in my game. I I looked at what you said, and actually I've identified here. Do you think I could have uh, broke a line here, or should we have switched player, or what do you think about this? And you're having those conversations with players. I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? What we managed to get to was it was it was brilliant in the culture we've we've kind of created is so one of the reasons I like using stats apart from the fact that it's factual and it helps track and all those different things players Objective. love it. yeah so, so see if we go back to the player being an individual all players have an ego and all players yeah. should be selfish because football's ruthless and see to make it they need to be a obsessed in terms of making themselves better coming in every day to make themselves better yeah but they need to have that little drive. And again, going back to the way they learn. So every football player in this country pretty much grows up playing FIFA, playing football manager, watching Monday night football and seeing all the stats. So separate them, educate them about what their role is. And like we talk about numbers and numbers being so important. You see players in interviews now talking about like James. See if we can get the players thinking like that. That drives their motivation. And what we got to was we play Fridays in Scotland, under 18 leagues on a Friday. We would be off on Saturday. Sunday morning, we'd have players knocking the door being like, is my development report, was was my passing score? So we do things like packing and passing scores for some of the players. Was my passing score better? Was my scan score better? Have you done this yet? Have you done that yet? And I'm sitting there going, we've not collected it yet, but I love it. And come back to me tomorrow. And, and as you, you're right, that's what you want to get to because one of the phrases we've used this year with under 18s is, See if your coach or your mum or your your teacher or whoever wants your career more than you, you've got no chance. Yeah. So we've got to try and find loads of different ways to motivate the player that they want their career more than anybody else wants it. Because players make players, coaches are there to facilitate it and help it. And we, as I said there, we're trying to inspire them and get their motivation up to try and drive them. But we're not making them. We're not in the gym with them when they're doing extra, when they come in on their days off, when we ask them to do individual practice. We can't stand and man mark 22 players during a session. So if we're doing three pitches, 3v3, three three, and we've got three coaches, and we're speaking to one player, and we're giving him a little bit of encouragement and all that, the other four players need to find it internally. So again, it all works together. I'm thinking about how you co-coach. You know, if you're working with more than one yeah. coach, how are you co-coaching? If Cameron's laser in these players, I'm responsible for these, and where are you putting your eyes? What are you... Have your intentions. Like I would often plan my sessions where I'm thinking, what am I really wanting to look for today? What am yeah, I yeah. literally wanting to look for? How's that linked to the individual plan for that for that kid? There's a word used about obsession, and yeah. I love it because whenever I heard Stephen talk, Stephen Gerrard, obviously he's just left Rangers now and he's at Villa, but when you listen to interviews when he talks about when he was a player, he always says, I was obsessed to be a footballer. I was absolutely obsessed. I wanted to be the best. And there was a phrase that I use in Coach Ed when I'm working with coaches is, how can we join obsessions? So if we're talking about like gamification and things like that, often we'll do a session, but we've kind of left it there. And then it's another topic. Even if we're working on similar principles, we don't really like revisit, even if it's, you know, who, who keeps track of the score? We've done a game. And let's say my team's beaten yours 4-2 in the game. Do we never go back to that game, you know, in the next session or whatever, or or any of the key things. So for me, I came up with this phrase of how do we join obsessions, find out what they're obsessed with and join those obsessions. Because if you look at gamification, you said it, championship manager, FIFA, 
Evo, whatever it is, what is it about those those games that makes you want to come back? Well, it's levels, it's differentiation. You can you can save your progress. You can you can get cheats. You can get clues. You're given different challenges. You're given missions. You know exactly what you need to achieve. Um, and again, you become obsessed, don't you? Me and you, are, we're similar age, so we'll have grown up on championship manager, football manager, playing all those. And we were there at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, playing championship manager, football manager. Why? Because there was something about it that pulled us, didn't it? So yeah. I love it. Um, and the only other couple of things I was going to add was when we're talking about uh, feedback. Well, even just before that, actually, I, I'll use that phrase again. It does depend for anyone listening. But equally, I think it's important to know what your biases are. My bias would definitely be if I'm working with, whether it's individuals or, again, it's context-specific, there's no reason why you couldn't do an unopposed practice per se as an argument, like you said. But my bias would definitely be not against metal men. But that's just my bias. That's not to say I've not done practices against cones or against mannequins or whatever. But my thing is, if we know the importance of perception, visual search, scanning, whatever words we want to use. A cone does a move, you know, and, and often a lot of coaches or coaching focuses more around the drill and coaches end up coaching more about the practice and focusing on the rules of that game. And they don't actually coach the players or what's in front of them. They're, they're literally looking at the session plan. Yeah. And for me, if we're wanting to develop these adaptive players and adaptive, obviously, coaches, you need to be good at observation. So you need to involve perception in your environment. Otherwise, it's, it's sanitizes. You're focusing more on, there's, a, there's two phrases I use, which is, can we try and get players to play in the future? So design practices that allow them to play in the future, be creative, think about the what if. Or is the design, the practice, or the feedback that we're using playing in abstract? Because often we're, we're like rehearsing these set patterns or the, the correct way of breaking down the, def- the the opposition. When the ball goes into Cameron here, you as a number seven, you roll into the half space, he's going to go on the out. And we can do that, but I think for coaches, it's understanding context, why. If you're going to do that, what's the trade-off? If you're going to go the other way, what's the trade-off? You know, what are the consequences? And, and just being really clear on what is it that I'm... I'm wanting to achieve today. And I think that was clear, you know, listening to you is that you're always being really meticulous in your planning. But what I like as well about you is that you're quite open in you use data and, and video, but yeah. only to enhance the coaching, not to replace it. It's not collecting data for data's sake. So fair play to you. Um, I love how you talked about individually focused. I think that's really key. And I, I think often like without going on a tangent myself, I always think coaching, is it geared or designed around the, the, the player? And you talked about that. And I think we should almost reposition the role of the coach as a learning designer and see him as that. And if yeah. we can see that, then it, their role will change. Um, I'm just curious, on those notes around what we've discussed, with, you, with the research you did with your PhD, just quickly, how... Is there anything within that when you were looking at coaching behaviours, environments with certain coaches, is there anything that's come out that has changed or influenced how you work currently or or just re, or even reaffirmed what you always knew? Um, I'm just curious in that. There may not be, but I'm just curious with your PhD if there was anything in particular that may have even shaped you know, some of the stuff we're talking about now. Yeah, the PhD it did and it didn't, if that makes sense. That's an awful answer. No, um, yeah, it's good. So just for those listening, uh, my PhD was in the recruitment and development of head coaches. So we looked at the SPL and EPL. So what we found was, if we look at the recruitment, first of all, it's as everyone describes, and it has been, listen, the last two years, there has been a significant change in football since money balls become a thing and teams are a lot more stats driven and everything else. But... Up until then, every manager I interviewed, they were headhunted. It was through a friend of a friend. It was through knowledge. You could basically trace every manager back to two or three godfathers of football. 
in NFL, they do things like coaching trees. And you can see that networks and it does come down to it's who you know, not what you know. And traditionally in football yeah. in Britain, that's just that. Network and profile, yeah. It does. It comes down to that. So that was reaffirmed because there was no real academic studies before that had done that. And really, although we all kind of knew it because you work in football, in terms of being in black and white and this is what the procedure is, the amount of managers are, so I interviewed eight uh, ex-England Premier League managers and none of them, none of them had done a formal interview. They'd never had to go. And so if you're looking at how much money is spent within the modern game and how much of a business it is and how much impact the head coach actually has on a club, the fact that you're willing to go and not even interview, like, could you imagine the world's leading bank needing a new manager to run all their organization? And they don't even interview the people. They just know a guy or they trust somebody. So that was really interesting. It kind of reaffirmed my belief that it's so hard to get into the game. Yeah. Because you need a break. And again, with somebody with my profile that's got no background and nobody has a clue who I am. There's people that when I joined Rangers still don't have a clue who I was. <laughs> when I first and I'd been appointed the the 18s coach. And and that's fine because listen, nobody should know who I am. Like, I've got no ego at all. Like I'm I'm surprised if anybody would. But it comes back to that. How do you get the best person in for the job if you're not doing things like that? So thankfully that has started to change. And then the second bit from the, the PhD that was really good was when we interviewed managers, what we did was we basically create a timeline of what they did. So most of them, actually all, all eight were ex-pros players. So they went from playing to coaching and it was right. so what was the step? So some of them went straight into management. Some of the older ones were player coaches and then went managers. Some of the new ones, or younger ones, sorry, I shouldn't say new, some of the younger ones that we interviewed were reserve team coaches. So we looked at the benefits of like a Pep Guardiola approach where they were the B team manager. They'd worked in the club, the new philosophy, the new players, and then they went up, which is quite a popular model in Spain and Holland where they do like to internally promote coaches, especially Germany. And I think that's, that's something that massively holds back British coaches. I think if you look at it and how how glossy and shiny and new and how every club views like a German coach or a Spanish coach. But if you look at their background, they've been like 16s managers or they've been under 18s coaches, but then they've been given a chance. Yeah. And it goes back to that, how many clubs in Britain give any of the youth coaches a chance? Now, thankfully, and hopefully we're starting to see the end of that. Obviously, Ipswich have just went and appointed um, McKenna, which is brilliant, who's a former youth coach at Tottenham and Man U, I think, before he went to the first Team, but yeah, even Notts Forest works yeah. in Notts Forest and that. Yeah. And if you look at Mick, again, Mick's a good example of youth coaches went to the first team and he's now working in our first team environment. You can only imagine how many top, top coaches are working across Britain, but they're stuck at 17s or 18s because they either don't want to put themselves out there because they know they're probably not going to succeed because there's no formal interviews or the interviews are already given to somebody else. Or if you look at it, there's just no opportunity because the amount of coaches that will get hired from being Dortmund's under 18s manager and they'll come over. But then you look at it and Man City and Chelsea and Liverpool's under 18s and the 23s teams are just as competitive worldwide as yeah. England just went and were on the under 17s World Cup. So they're obviously top managers as well, but for some reason, whatever it is. But then I also think the flip of that. So whilst I'm saying there that I would love to see clubs being much more open-minded to appointing young British coaches to see how good we really are. If the English FA is going to say that their coach education system is world-leading, then those coaches need to start getting opportunities to actually be world-class at the top level. But then the flip side is, I don't think enough coaches actually go out of their comfort zone. So Not I enough would, to, yeah. Not enough go abroad, was, do they? I was desperate to go abroad. Yeah. So when the chance came to go to Ghana, although it wasn't my first destination, in terms of her sitting down and going, right, where could you go? I would never have thought Ghana, but when the opportunity arose, I was desperate to go. Yeah. Because British coaches and British players, again, some of the younger generations getting better at that, going abroad to play. But we don't do anywhere near enough of that. So we can't criticise clubs that want to go and look uh, abroad and into Europe for something different if the coaches themselves aren't prepared to go and develop themselves in that way and go and work in Germany or go and try and work in France or Spain or Africa yeah. or or Brazil, or South, like go work somewhere different and make yourself better rather than be born and bred in a city, stay in that city, work in the youth academy, and then have no other experiences. So 
it's not that one side of the argument's right or one side of the argument's wrong, but if you want to go somewhere, you need to find ways to overcome things like that. So I was very aware that when I was in Aberdeen, I was in a massive bubble. As I said already, Aberdeen's a one-city club. There's nothing else there. All the good players go to Aberdeen. All the good coaches end up going to Aberdeen if they want to. And it's like, that's what you are. So I didn't know anything different. So I had to get myself out of that bubble to go somewhere different because you don't know what you don't know. That old phrase is so true. Completely. Until you go and experience something or learn or be curious enough to ask the questions, you're never going to extend your knowledge base or or your actual ability to coach. So I think it all works in tandem. So that was kind of the summary from the PhD. No, and it's interesting because, it, I mean, listen, you, you're talking to somebody who's preaches to the choir, aren't you? I mean, <laughs> obviously it is different as well because there's multiple contexts, isn't there? If you're young, yeah. you haven't got a family, you haven't got, you know, obviously I've got kids, I've got two kids, I've got a wife, got houses, different. And even now then it, it makes it more challenging. If you're young, you're in your 20s, you've got no ties, you know, I would be, I mean, I would go at any age anyway. I would go to India, I'd go to China, I'd go to Africa. But if you're young, I'd 100%, if you've got no ties, get abroad, get as much experience as you can, especially for people like myself and you who haven't got 500, 600, whatever, you know, profile of a top league player. You're, you're almost creating other experiences that give you that unfair competitive advantage. Yep. I think it is changing because, I mean, even some of the interviews I've had, I've had to present philosophies, vision. I mean, I've, I've interviewed for under 23 Z coach roles at a Premier League, Cat One Academy. That was meticulous. Um, you know, first team managers' roles in the Football League, even to academies, you're presenting, aren't you? Um, I mean, and the point you made there, I think we're seeing a change now, an evolution. I mean, Tom Coulshaw, I did my A license with Tom, and obviously he's a okay. good mate of Stevie's. And, you know, they play together at Liverpool. But again, Tom worked in the International Academy and works as an academy coach at Liverpool, as you know, in the YDP and what have you, has gone on. Mickey Beale, as he said. Um, I mean, there's so many, isn't there? Look at Steve Cooper, yeah. who's gone on and done well at Swansea and other clubs. Wrexham, Liverpool and, and so on. And, you know, and there's a lot now. I think with we're seeing a change. I think there's still the old guard that are probably going round and they're doing the merry-go-round. They still get the jobs, but I think eventually they're getting less and less. And at some point, you know, most of them are getting whittled out. It's becoming harder for them to become employed because the for me, the future coach coming in now and the current coach is someone who's highly educated, has got passions or a specialism in certain little projects. There's got something about them. You know, you've done your PhD, you've done your UA for A, you've done other. It's those added extras, isn't it? That's yeah. the level you're competing with. And for years, the foreign coaches who were coming in who aren't necessarily better than the British coaches, but they had that perceived profile, as you said, which is right. But a lot of those guys had master's degrees, were qualified teachers, were doctorates, were um, UEFA pro license or whatever. So, uh, and like you said, they worked in the academy system, like in Germany. And But I think it's changing, isn't it? And hopefully for the better and, I think we're going to see more and more interesting, really educated, clever, creative coaches. Um, one thing I'd put out there, I'd be interested to know, maybe it could be a conversation for the next chat we do. Often there's always been this perception that, you know, good just because you're a good player doesn't mean you're going to be a good coach. Um, and often a lot of players don't always transition well. I'd be interested to see what it looks like in the future. Yeah. Because the player coming through now is totally different. The ones that came through... When Stevie was playing, it was pretty much run here, do this, do that. F and Jeff, you lazy, whatever, and all that. The coaching now is more intelligent, data-driven analytics. You know, players are their own CEOs, aren't they? They're hiring their own chefs. They're hiring their own team. They're watching the video clips. They might have a better idea of what went on in the performance than even the coaches because they're reviewing the clips as well. And so... I think the player coming through now is a lot more educated because of the stuff that even you're doing at Rangers and what have you. So it'd be interesting to see, will those be actual better coaches yeah. or not? You know, I mean, that'd be an interesting one, but I'm, I'm conscious of time. It's an unbelievable chat with you. Honestly, it's been incredible. If I can, I wouldn't mind getting a quick fire round from you. Uh, Just, what was that? A quick fire round questions. Go for it. I'm just it. literally it's the first time I've done it. I'm just shooting from the hip. 
what 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 challenges you right now in your in your coaching journey? So if, literally quick fire round, 10 seconds, 30 seconds max answer. So the first question will be what challenges you now uh are you facing in your in your current coaching journey that you, you're overcoming or will have to overcome? Uh, managing each individual's journey for their expectations. So the big quote we're using right now is expectation versus reality. Ooh, so I, I like it. That yeah. is definitely my biggest challenge right now. Because as I say, we've got 18, 18 players in the 18s. Every single one of them's got different expectation, different reality. Yeah, that's it. And what, what's the what's the future game look like for you? Uh, the future what game what is... For me, I think it's going to go way more 1v1. I think it's going to become all over the pitch. You can see it already in terms of the press and the low block, everything else, the way that Leeds play. I think the game's going to become more African and South American. And I think it's going to go back to that to then go back to being more zonal. So I think we've went so zonal for the last 20 years in terms of how we play and positional play and everything else like that. I think it's going to flip to going 1v1 and then it'll flip back as football does in cycles. Yeah. And what 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 uh, what future rule changes do you predict, or would you like to see? If you future were to predict, I would probably like to see ball and play some of the basketball. I, I'm quite a purist. I think I hate watching teams that try and slow the game down and time waste and all that. I would love to see if it goes down to thirty minutes a half, but it's a stop clock. That's my biggest one. Oh, stop clock! Yeah, that make it interesting. Yeah, for sure. If you look at the study, did a study with the Premier League and the average ball and play times between like 56 and 62 minutes. Yeah. Like if you're if you're a fan going to watch the best players in the world or you, you're going to watch your team, you want to watch football. Mm. Now, I would feel really cheated and you do sometimes feel cheated when you watch a match and a team's actively from the first minute just doing everything they can to stop play, wasting time and all that, bringing a stop clock and I think it changes all those things. So that would be my big change. No, nah, that's up, man. I mean... It's interesting because we had something like that similar to us asked to us. And some of the guys, I mean, VAR has been on the cards for a while. And obviously that's influenced ball in, the, ball in play as well. But, you know, we, we had chats around like, what if the goalkeeper could, this was mine, what if the goalkeeper could handball the ball outside the penalty area? Because that would just fuck it, that would totally change it. Some people liked it, some people didn't. I was saying, <laughs> but what if he could? What if he could actually catch the ball and it's not a foul? Because yeah. they're already got aggressive start positions anyway. Keepers now, you know, some of them they're on that beyond the halfway line. So, what if he could really be the eleventh man? And I'm not saying turn it into American football or basketball, but there'd have to be certain maybe constraints around that. Or even what if he could do a kicking or a dribbling, and as well as a throwing, so yeah. rather than always being a throwing, that he could do. Or can you um, throw to yourself? Or kick in, like if it's a free kick, can you pass to yourself? Because straight away players would just do a little, like we would do on the street, yeah. knock it to yourself and then have a shot, you know. So I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting because I think the objective of the game is we've got the, the best sport in the world, haven't we? There's no question of that. It's the most entertaining, most commercial sport in the world. And the biggest mission of FIFA, surely then, must be to continue to make football, soccer, the number one sport in the world. So the only way I can see that is how do you make it more entertaining? And yeah, it'd be interesting. Arsene Wenger, for example, when asked a similar question, he reckons that social media will make the first substitute. So he believes that technology will be that the the fans will actually make substitutes on the pitch. And the other and even like <laughs> things around avatars and things like that, yeah. The virtual reality, but who knows? That's a crazy thought. Fans making subs. Yeah. <laughs> As entertainment, gambling, can you imagine? Because he it, it, was thinking it from that perspective. Not that that's why I, I worded it to you of what would you like to see, not what could be. But yeah. if, if you were in control of it, what rules would you like to introduce? But yeah, absolute pleasure of having you on. Honestly, it's been amazing. And uh, yeah, really Thank appreciate it. No, it's been a pleasure. Sorry, I've taken up so much time. I know we said we're going to keep this short as well. I've been <laughs> on for ages. No, top man, outstanding.